Welcome to Almost Here, Around the Corner of Future Technology Podcasts with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used. We're just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Welcome one and all to the Future Tech Podcast. I am Alan Thomas. And today we have the co-founders of Excel Bio with us, Brian Feth and James Lim. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Oh, no problem. No problem. So uh, we'll jump right into it. Uh, what is Excel Bio and what do you guys do? We're a, a five-year-old company founded out of the Berkeley ecosystem. Um, our specialty is growing human cells and tissues, which is pretty challenging to do outside of the body. And uh, we've applied that technology to solving some big problems in cancer research and in drug development, uh, specifically therapies that are starting to use human cells as the therapy itself. Ah, so uh, so this would be so this would be similar. Uh, so would it, so it would be similar to stem cell research then, or would it be in the same ballpark? Some of our work uh, includes stem cells. Uh, some of it includes uh, primary cancers, and some includes uh, immune cells. So our our foundation. Uh, was really trying to serve the need of allowing uh, ourselves actually access to um, primary tumor biopsies and the ability to really propagate those, uh, particularly from what are usually pretty rare samples or limited samples, and those that, those samples can be pretty expensive too. So just being able to have uh, access to these samples, to be able to study them, to be able to run diagnostics on them, um, has been pretty important and pretty challenging. Most most of the field uses something called cell lines. Uh, which are really proxies for a, a patient's cancer, um, and they're a little bit of a one-size-fits-all type of approach to to studying the disease. But if you really want to understand all the nuanced uh, differences between individuals' cancers and really understand which drug might be appropriate for an individual cancer or an individual patient, you actually have to be able to, to extract that, that information from the patient itself. Um, and the, the easiest way to do that is, is through a biopsy and then ultimately through uh, molecular analysis of some sort. Stem cells are an important part of what we do as well. Uh, stem cells are being used um, in the research setting and in the drug development setting to drive uh, mature cell types that are otherwise really challenging to get biopsies from. So one obvious example is you want to study neurological disease. Um, researchers are starting to take, for instance, uh, punch biopsies or skin biopsies from, say, a schizophrenic patient, uh, convert those into stem cells, and then uh, redrive those cells back into a neuronal phenotype to be able to start understanding what's happening in neurons. But, and so basically, at the core of it, we built uh, you know, a, a technology that could grow your human cells outside of your body. And that could be stem cells or immune cells that are important for immunotherapy. Wow, so, so, so this type of work could, could, um, could basically, could one pretty much eliminate cancers or eliminate allergies or just eliminate, I guess, problem cells? That's absolutely correct. And I think some of the recent advances in the clinic are really, really exciting. Um, and some of the more exciting sort of therapies that are in development is taking blood cells, white blood cells specifically, from your blood, throwing them outside of your body and training them to kill cancer cells. And then we would reinfuse these cells back into your body once they've been trained to hone in on and target cancer cells that are that are proliferating and expanding inside your body. Quite a few drug companies focused on that space now, um, and they're, they're making really great progress. The first actual couple products were released toward the end of 2017. Uh, but the field is really left without technologies that allow you to do that easily, reproducibly, and in a controlled way. And so we've kind of focused our company around enabling people to really manage, expand human cells easily, reproducibly, and we're really just kind of squarely aiming the company at that immunotherapy space that James just mentioned. Uh, so would you say that, that Excel Bio works directly with hospitals or with labs or a little bit of both, kind of a cross-section of both? Yeah, I, I think we work with a, really a wide variety of people. There's, um, you know, our target customers are um, kind of large academic institutes and, and then principally pharmaceutical companies that are developing these drugs. Um, but certainly a lot of the really kind of um, – novel ideas are coming out of the research setting, and there's a lot of challenges in being able to grow a, a whole range of human uh, cells. And so there's really demand um, kind of across cell types and across labs for being able to have human cells available to them to work with. 
And so how did Excel Bio come about? Are you two scientists by trade or? Yeah, we both, we both are scientists by training. Um, James uh, is a, has been a scientist throughout his career. I've been on the business side, focused on strategy um, as well as finance in my career. Um, James and, is actually the inventor of the underlying platform technology, and, and the kind of ideas for ultimately what we build came out of kind of foundational principles and some of his research uh, in his past, and maybe you can give you some detail on that. <clears throat> and so, uh, the, again, as Brian mentioned earlier on, and we spun out of the UC Berkeley ecosystem about five years ago. Uh, I was a postdoctoral research scientist uh, working at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and Brian at the time was enrolled in the MBA program at Haas Business School. And uh, we got together, uh, formulated an idea, and proposed a, a project where we thought we could create a commercial, commercially viable product that could essentially do what was thought to be impossible, which was to keep and maintain human cells outside of the body growing and happy. Wow. And then it just... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We, um, I was going to say that we kind of focused the company on cancer really right from the start. Um, we had uh, gone to a few conferences, and I think um, we felt felt very disappointed, actually, while we were at these conferences. A lot of news was being shared about advances being developed in different drugs, and we're talking about extensions of life by a month or two. And uh, I think at that point, we felt not only kind of, uh, I think, disappointed at the progress that was being made, um, but, but also excited about the opportunity to be able to maybe dramatically improve that through just much better capabilities upstream of in, in the drug development process, to be able to understand the activity of drugs at the patient level, you know, well before the cost and, expe- uh, and, and kind of r- risk to patients um, in a clinical setting where drugs ultimately, you know, go before they get approved. And, and as far as the, the, the companies and institutions that you guys work with, uh, is there a, is, are the conferences you mentioned the way that you figure out who you're actually going to work with, what organizations you're actually going to work with? Um, yeah, yes and no. Conferences are a great source of, of information about what people are doing. And um, we, we have a small team now of about 15. Uh, some of that team is comprised of commercial folks. And um, you know, they, they, they spend time going out and, and meeting with researchers at uh, prominent universities, uh, talking with uh, pharmaceutical development companies that are working on different drugs. Um, and our, our products are currently in, in a range of different labs um, from uh, kind of cutting-edge gene therapy companies that are in the news every day um, to large institutional uh, pharmaceutical customers like Bayer, um, which has been a, a long supporter of ours, to, uh, to academic research institutes and even the government. Um, we have some systems uh, at the NCI that have been, been used quite a bit for uh, immune development work. Um, and so we, we've, you know, I think have focused our efforts uh, on the pharmaceutical development process, but uh, as I said, these cells are primary cells, patient-derived cells are really a valuable source of information at every level of of the research and development process. Just to add to that, I think we're really at the cusp of an evolution, if you will, um, in in terms of therapeutic design and implementation. Um, It's kind of new that this idea of taking cells from our bodies growing them outside of our bodies, and then programming them or reprogramming them, training them to, to perform all of these crazy functions like killing cancer cells or regenerating skin. Um, all of these things require uh, the production of, of living human cells in large enough quantities to make sort of a therapeutic impact. And you can sort of imagine that, you know, the next wave or the evolution, if you will, is going to solely depend on, uh, on on cells as well as small molecules and chemical mediators to achieve essentially desired outcomes. And that could mean just uh, reducing cancer risk, uh, preventing t- uh, cancer relapse, as well as other application areas in stem cell uh, rejuvenation and anti-aging. This move toward uh, human cells has really been a, a really dramatic shift that probably folks outside of healthcare wouldn't necessarily be familiar with. But you know, over the last couple decades, uh, chemicals have really dominated um, therapeutics. There was a, a big shift maybe a couple decades ago to, to start looking at um, antibodies that are produced produced by um, some cell types. Um, and, and it's really only been in the last few years where um, starting to think about using immune cells specifically as a therapy has come forward. There has been a lot of discussion around stem cells. I think the reality of using that as regenerative medicine is still on its way, even after kind of discussion over the last couple of decades. It's actually immune cells that are becoming really the first regenerative medicine, per se, to be used broadly for, for therapeutic use. And, you know, the, the one
one of the, the reasons that there's been such a seat change is it's been so difficult to grow human cells that people have really reverted to proxies of the disease when they need to start studying it. And, you know, people use everything from um, several decade old um, cervical cancer cells uh, from a, a single patient uh, to study a whole range of different cancers that have nothing to do with cervical cancer and, and certainly don't look like a 40-year-old cell line or 50 or 60-year-old cell line. They use uh, mouse cells, Chinese hamster ovaries, uh, just a really a wide range of cells, yeast, bacteria, and um, they're not always, and most of the time, not predictive of what you might see in an actual patient. And and when you talk about using the uh, uh, using immune cells, has, I, I know normally, like as far as mainstream media, you you always usually hear controversy when people mention stem cells. But has there has there been any kind of, um, or, or do you foresee any kind of roadblocks or obstacles to more widespread use of using the immune cell, like you said? So I think I think what's interesting, um, and again, I think in, it's, it's really important to have context. And um, right now, um, you know, we're championing personalized medicine, personalized therapies. And the truth is, um, we say those things, but in, in reality, it's very difficult to implement personalized therapeutic regimens. It's just the way that uh, drug approval process is set up by the FDA. However, in the context of cell-based therapies, these are your cells that we are growing. Nobody else's cells are going to be reintroduced into your body. The idea is to take cells that are natively in your body, grow them outside of your body, do a little tricks, and then reinfuse it back. And so the idea is that these cells, again, will have a memory of what the cancer may look like, and more importantly, your body will not reject these cells because it will notice it, notice it as being itself. I hope that makes sense. I, I'll add on to that. I think the only barrier to, to, to kind of delivering this therapy isn't, isn't one of uh, ethical discussion. It's, it's actually a business model discussion. Pharmaceutical companies have traditionally built their business on a really low marginal cost of production. So these pills, uh, you know, cost fractions of pennies sometimes to pump out. And obviously, there's there's you know, as much as billion plus dollars spent on developing these drugs, but once you get to actually delivering them, um, the, the marginal cost is really low. And so the whole machinery of the pharmaceutical production delivery system is is kind of built around that. It's had to change and, and adjust slightly for a higher cost, uh, more complex um, antibody based therapy that it, that's been being used pretty broadly now. But th this idea of uh, one patient, one therapy. Um, in a with, a with a cell therapy model is, is a whole, you know flips the whole thing on its head and I think it's going to be very challenging for the industry to adjust to. And that actually comes into what my next question was. I was interested in hearing um, both of your opinions about what the future of this industry would look like to you. I mean, just everything completely personalized from the smallest ailments to the largest, or you know, is that what is that what you, is that where you think it would be headed? James and I agreed early on. Um, I think that. If there's a therapy that can cure you, people will, will demand it. They will have access to it regardless of business model. And so um, the key is to try to make it as, as functional within that context as possible so that you're not just delivering this to, to those that can pay very, very high prices to get them. And you know, I think the, for, there's a lot of controversy. I've been on panels where, you know, opposing opinions on this topic about whether production of these cells is centralized as they have traditionally been at pharmaceutical companies at manufacturing sites or so whether this, uh, this work really – production becomes decentralized and much closer to the patient. And I always uh, point to IVF um, and vitro fertilization and how that lives really at centers of excellence that are, that are pretty close to patients um, so that you can drive there, have the pro procedure done, and come back a few, a few days later for reimplantation. So I think that kind of model is, might be something that we see a, a really evolve with cell therapy. I get really excited when I think about sort of the future applications in which we could perform when we can actually reproducibly grow any human cell type at any given moment. And so the general idea is that if you have this power of growing cells outside of the body, they could serve many different medical uses. Um, and a few simple examples would be provided. Training these white blood cells or immune cells to kill your cancer cells is very exciting. But also for regenerative medicine, as well as anti-aging, the idea that you can get an injection of stem cells and look younger or your heart cells be better um, through the introduction of these um, beating, cardio, uh, beating cardiomyocytes. And so I think all of this stuff seems space age, but the idea is that it's actually happening right now. 
And so we think that the future is 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 going to be peppered with all kinds of different opportunities that we just haven't been able to imagine, them, just because, again, we just haven't been able to reproducibly grow human cells outside of the body. And, and I'll, I'll add one more thing to that, which is, as well as edit, um, and that's been a new technology, CRISPR specifically, has been talked about quite a bit uh, recently in scientific circles, a very precise cutting. Growing cells, editing cells, um, allows you to do some really amazing things in human biology. And then uh, just for that, CRISPR genome editing, you know, you can easily edit one or two cells but then they're still met with the problem that they need to expand these genome edited cells in order to be therapeutically relevant. And so we work very well with genome editing strategies and the fact that we're downstream. Once you have your cells of interest that have been properly edited, use our system to expand these cells. And so, and, and just keeping and just keeping in line with that last question, I wanted to ask about the, uh, so what does the, the, the roadmap for Excel Bio look like for these next few years? I mean, uh, what what are the plans going forward? Yeah, so we, we have our first product in the market currently that I um, mentioned we have a small commercial team that's supporting. That product's called the Avatar, which uh, we think is um, really appropriate for the th- types of things we're trying to do, which is really create the ability to, to have a, a cell model of that patient um, actually outside of the patient to be able to modify, do research on, or, or even put back in the patient as a therapy. That I think foundational set of principles was really important for us as a company to to produce and put out in the marketplace. And now that we've started seeing some really good traction, um, we're starting to think about how we can take those foundational principles and move them into a really high growth, large field. And um, as I mentioned in, earlier in the discussion, that we, we focus the company's efforts on immune, immunotherapy um, and starting with the immune cell and then kind of working from there out to screening tools to be able to actually look at immune cell activity or your drug's activity on the immune cell in the context of a tumor cell or in the context of a healthy normal cell to look at efficacy uh, of that therapy as well as look at toxicity and and safety issues that might result from that therapy on normal tissue. So we're building a device um, that we've codenamed Cali that's um, ultimately going to be used for real-time drug screening and real-time information about those cells as they're growing in culture. And um, being able to use environmental control, which is a key aspect of our technology, to exert influence on that cell behavior and function to try to understand, for instance, how a drug might act in a a native kind of a primary tumor environment versus a a metastatic environment where the the tumor started to spread. And those environments can be very different. And um, that technology, I think we're really planning to roll directly into um, a cell manufacturing field where the same kind of capability um, wouldn't necessarily in that instance be used for making a decision about which drug to progress, but actually be able to make a decision about the quality of that therapy before you put it back into a patient. And um, so we're, we're gearing up to really slot into this growing but nascent field of uh, cell production. So a patient comes in to have their cells removed, um, modified, and then put back in them for a therapy. That process really needs to be standardized, reproducible, and uh, produce efficacious cells that when they go back in the body behave the way you expect them to. And so we're, we're building products to ultimately solve that problem. Wow. So the, um, and, let me, and let me ask you this. I always ask, uh, most, I always ask all the guests this. About um, in terms of where you guys are right now versus um, what are some of the developments that maybe are, are ideas that some people come up with where you say, well, this could happen maybe in the next two to five years, but what you're talking about would take 20 to 30 years. Great question. Um, you know, I think disease, I think we're learning, is um, not easily defined by an organ, um, but is actually appropriately defined as something specific that's broken. Um, it can be something genetic or in, in the kind of protein pathways and how they interact. But that that thing that's broken ultimately Um, causes the disease and is the thing that you need to either correct or target to destroy in order to solve the disease. And and I think we're making a huge amount of progress in cancer, and these immune cells are a huge advance because it allows your immune system to do the work um, that it's really designed to do um, and fight cancers. And I think that as we start to kind of move into this field, um, we're going to start knocking off specific subtypes of disease um, by molecular pathway origin. And yeah, I think the thing that's going to take quite a while is is cleaning up large categories of cancer. Um, and I do think we'll, we'll get there, and that'll happen over time. But it, it's going to be kind of small baby steps um, by subtype. 
to get to that place. And I think, you know, the, there are diseases that are easier to access and easier to grow and um, where immune cells are more effective in getting to that will be knocked off first. And, and in fact, uh, that's already the case. Uh, the first two therapies on the market are, uh, are targeting blood-based cancers um, just because they're, they're easier for the immune cells to access and do, do work on. But as we get better about uh, longevity of these, these therapies in patients and, and how to um, really target them to specific areas, I, I think we'll see uh, more and more different cancers dropping off. Um, but it, it's a process of decades uh, to, to really start making huge chunks of, of progress in, in cancer. I mean, I think the same is actually true for, for stem cells. Um, you know, once the, it really requires a process for um, the patient to come in, have their cells removed, to be uh, cultured under a defined condition, and then reintroduced back to the patient um, in a way that allow them to, to um, return to a normal, healthy state. And um, that, that process, I, I think we'll, we'll start to see success maybe with diabetes, um, type 1, and as well as obviously some skin diseases. Um, that process, again, is going to be... I would say small steps. Um, we'll, we'll start knocking off things, but um, eventually we get to a place where we're going to be good enough at working with human cells that, you know, as, as you start to develop heart disease, you'll come in for a refresh on on your heart condition, and that that's probably decades off. But I think we'll, we'll start to see that level of 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 catered kind of therapeutic self control for for yourself. And if our listeners want to learn more about Avatar and Excel Bio, what's the the best way to engage with the company? engage with you guys? Uh, we're on Twitter, and uh, it's at Excel Bio. We're also on, um, we have a website, excelbio.com. Um, that's X-C-E-L-L-B-I-O.com, uh, and that's the, the same for the Twitter handle. And um, certainly, if you're in San Francisco, we're, we're always happy to have visitors, so um, you can stop by the lab. Oh, that's great. That's that's really, that's that's great that y'all are, that, that y'all are so open, where you can, well, you'll actually take visitors in and kind of let them get a get a first-hand look at what you're doing. Yep. We do customer tours all the time, and I think, you know, the, the, the tools that we're selling uh, are really enabling and really new, and I think, um, you know, for researchers that are interested in the space and starting to work with, with human tissues in some form or another, um, we're, we're pretty easy to work with and always happy to, to discuss it. Um, and I think that probably for the email address, the easiest to get a hold of us at innovate at excelbio.com. Okay. Well, Brian and James, thank you both for coming on, and and we appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you. Sure. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks for the discussion. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, both to review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.